Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey folks, when we claim to follow Jesus and his teachings, should we advocate for government? Are we putting the golden rule into action when we advocate for government? Are we really doing unto others when we run to the voting booth or advocate for a political party? Today, Larkin Rose comes on the show to discuss this and so much more. Let's go. Yeah. Left, right, left, right, left. We got our marching orders, man. Left, right, left, right. Would you rather serve God than serve Caesar? You know me? Right. I'm just trying to live what he said. I'm just trying to live. Larkin, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Man, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Um, our mutual friend, Dan, who I've had on the show, he uh, he submitted a couple articles of himself for our, from himself or on our blog, and I had him on the show to talk about one of them. I need to get him back on to talk about the other one, but he told me when we got done recording that that afternoon, he said, yeah, I'm friends with Larkin. He was really kind of casual about it. He goes, I, him and his family stayed at my house, and you know, he goes, I could probably talk him into coming on your show. And I was like, don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> and then it, that's been a few months ago. And, and I, I didn't really ever forget about it, but it just kind of went off to the side. And then I woke up the other day and I had a message from him and a message from you. I'm like, OK, here we go. Yep, it's fixing to happen. So I'm pretty thankful for Dan doing that and getting us connected. And then also thankful for his friendship, because I, over the past few months, I've gotten to know Dan pretty well. You know, we'll have uh, Zoom calls on our discuss from our discussion group off of Facebook, and he'll pop in from time to time on that, and he'll give me a call on Signal, and we'll sit and chat for forty five minutes or an hour. And this guy's he's such a deep thinker, and he's such a he's just such a good human being. Yeah, and we need more people like him in this world, and and I, and I love him dearly, and I'm so thankful that that our paths have crossed. You know, and had it not been for the Bad Roman Project, I may have never yeah met this man ever in my life or had the opportunity to talk to him. Yeah. And he's the kind of person that when he recommends I do something, I check in on it. <laughs> I assume it's probably a good idea if Dan says I should. So, so far he was right. <laughs> <laughs> so far. We just got started. We're only two minutes in. I'll let you decide yeah. by the end. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so what I like to do in the, in the vast majority of the folks listening to this show know who Larkin Rose is. And what I'm hoping that this this episode is going to be is like a resource for them to to share with friends and family who are kind of I like to call them fence sitters, kind of teetering on the edge of anarchy as Christians. Trying, they're they're coming to the realization that there's something wrong and we should not be that the empire is just so evil. And as a Christian, when you really take the teachings of Christ seriously, maybe we shouldn't be entangled with this stuff. And I think that's what's going to happen is they're going to take this episode and be able to share it with their friends and family. And hopefully, like you, like I told you before we started recording your book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, got me over the hump, okay? And I'm hoping that this will help get folks over the hump and we can get more Christian anarchists out there advocating for peace and advocating for no king but Christ, you know, and and, and stop, stop uh, legitimizing a system that is just pure evil. I mean, let's not, let's not mix any words about this. It's pure evil. There's nothing... Yeah going on that is good from government because there's anything the government does, whether they, it looks like they've got good intentions, mm-hmm. they're harming somebody somewhere in some fashion. And nobody lays this out better than Larkin Rose does. Okay. So, but, but just for those folks who may not know who Larkin is, who they're going to share these episodes with, why don't you give us a little background of yourself and then they can decide for themselves as well. Well, I was, I was raised in a, a sect of Christianity And my dad was a science and math teacher for about a bazillion years. Not only the little church I grew up in, but obviously my father taught doubting as a good thing, like doubting and reasoning and understanding and figuring things out, like making the truth your own, as opposed to just deciding to believe something because somebody said it. So I always like to to debate and to argue and to, you know, battle inside my head with different ideas and also debate with other people. 
Um, and I was, they were basically conservative, kind of constitutionalist, libertarian leaning. So that's what I was raised in. And I like to debate and argue. And, you know, it's pretty easy to debate and argue against the political left that wants government violence to like control everything. But one thing I wasn't accustomed to doing was trying to justify the things that I wanted government to do, which was a pretty short list compared to almost everybody else. So by the time I was married, I was still libertarian and stuff, and I was debating with people. And I was basically trying to narrow down the concept of government to the the actually legitimate moral the best legitimate moral government there could be. And to me, it was never about the practical thing. Like if somebody says, well, it will work better to do this evil thing. Okay. Whether you're right or not, I'm not cheering for that. (laughs) Like I would rather do the right thing and not have a certain outcome be as nice as you want. So for me, it was never a question of the practical and what works and what doesn't. It was, I want to eliminate from my view of government that which is inherently immoral. And violent aggression is inherently immoral. I mean, that's, I don't know how much more (laughs) clear Jesus could have been about don't commit violence against people, especially being the aggressor, like not talking about defending yourself, but like going and attacking somebody else for the good of society or whatever your lame excuse may be. So I very accidentally fell off the political spectrum by narrowing down government. It's like, well, it can't do this. And it has no right to have a monopoly even on protecting people. Like, okay, you can, you can protect people. That's legitimate. But if somebody else comes along and says, I I, want to run a business and I protect them. Well, government has no right to force people to fund their version of protection, especially if they're doing a crummy job. And they have no monopoly and they have no special rights. And I whittled down government until I got to the ideal government and then realized that's not government. That's just people being people. They don't claim any special right to do anything. They're not lawmakers. Their commands aren't laws anymore. It's just people. And people have the right to like defend others and help others and, you know, help those in need, but they don't have the right to rob me to do it. So when I whittled it down to the version of government that's actually moral, I accidentally realized that's not government anymore. It has no it has no jurisdiction because anybody else can say, well, I'm going to do that. It has no special power. It has no special authority. Its commands aren't laws. It doesn't have the right to rob anybody in the name of taxation to do it. It just sort of turned into people. And I was like, wait a minute, is, is, isn't there a word for advocating no government? Oh, yeah, that makes me an anarchist. Mm, that's a little weird. Wasn't really expecting to get there. But that's just literally the definition. And it's rule by no one. That, that's what the term anarchy means. Literally rule by no one. Just the same way as monarchy is rule by one person. Anarchy is rule by no one. And to accidentally get to the point where I realize not just like almost everybody knows that government can be corrupt and it does bad things. And, but they, most people assume that, well, there's a way to make it legitimate and just, and like seems to never happen, but theoretically (laughs) there's a way to have a good government that, and I came to the realization that not just on a practical basis, but conceptually, it is impossible for government to be legitimate and moral and still be government. If you do all the things to make it legitimate and moral, now it's just people being people and doing the right thing. And so I got there completely accidentally. Now, at the same time, I it, it's such a complex thing. We, we can talk about like whichever um, aspects, aspects of this you want to. I'm not a member of the religion I grew up in. And at the same time, there's there's so many issues on which I complain about both sides. <laughs> like there's two sides of the issue, and I'm I'm wincing at both of them and going, oh, you're both missing stuff. Um and so I don't identify 
as a Christian. And I also don't identify as an atheist, which is a little bit weird, but most of the people who wear the label atheists are what I would call materialists. Like a lot of them, and this isn't true of all of them, but a lot of them think, oh, we're just, as Richard Dawkins put it, we're just big lumbering robots. <laughs> like we have chemical stuff and going on in our heads. But we're basically just robots. That, that's how he put it. And I'm like, maybe you are, but I have like a conscience and free will and stuff. Like I've never been inside his head. Maybe he's just a pre-programmed robot, but I kind of think that I have the ability to A, distinguish between right and wrong and B, act accordingly. So I, I absolutely believe in right and wrong. In fact, that is entirely why I'm an anarchist. It has nothing to do with, well, which of these systems do you think would have a better outcome? It's which of these systems is a moral way for human beings to act and to treat one another. And government isn't that ever. And it's weird how many things I have in common with Christians. And I know there are plenty of, of anarchists who are, who are atheists, or, and there's a plenty who are agnostic and whatever else. There's a whole lot I agree with about um, with Christians more so than lots of than I agree with lots of other people. And to me, I break it down to two categories. There's sort of, well, the word I use if I don't believe in the things is the mythology, um, the stories, the the what people believe, like believing Jesus was the Son of God and and what happened and how much of the Bible is literal and and things like that. And then there's how do they treat other people? How do they behave as a human being? And for the first category, I almost just don't care. Like people can, people can say they believe in the Bible and be absolute, complete jerks and identify as Christians, or they can be really dang nice, smart, awesome people like Dan, for example, and wear the same label. So to me, it got to the point where that label is meaningless to me because I've seen judgmental, nasty, obnoxious jerks wear it and the nicest people in the world wear it. And so to me, the thing that matters is, well, who are you and how do you treat other people? And whether or not we agree about the, the story of the origins of, of you know, what God exactly is or what this would mean or how much of these books are literally true and how much are symbolic of something else. Like every once in a while, I'll have that discussion with some people, but mostly I just don't care. Like on a practical level, I see a whole lot of people living pretty close to what Jesus described without calling themselves Christians. And then I see a bunch of people who call themselves Christians and do that. Right. And then I see a bunch of people who are nasty and violent and selfish and horrible and inconsiderate and callous. <laughs> some of them call themselves Christians, which is always just boggling to me. And some of them call themselves atheists. Like I know plenty of obnoxious jerks who wear the label of atheists. <laughs> so to me, I'm far less concerned with what is true about the, the stories, the mythology, the background of some belief system than I am of what kind of person are you? How do you treat other people? How do you interact with other human beings? Because even if it's just on a practical basis. I mean, if somebody thinks that I'm going to burn in hell if I don't share their beliefs, okay, that's... And if they're trying to convince me because they think my my soul is in danger, I can sort of appreciate that. Like, <laughs> thanks for trying to say, do what you think is saving my soul. <laughs> but as far as living in society, like here on this earth, in this life, what matters is whether people recognize the self-ownership of other people and whether they abide by the non-aggression principle. In other words, I'm not going to attack other people. And that is very much in line with what Jesus taught, you know, attack people. Like even people who did things wrong, he was like, well, you can be all judgmental and like stone them and stuff. And he'll just go to them and say, um, sin no more and be on your way. Instead of, hey, everybody, let's get all mad and condemn this person and stone them to death and stuff. He was like, um, how, about, how about you mostly focus on making yourself better people, maybe? And so in a lot of ways, I feel, I feel a whole lot in common. Um, 
E- okay, here's the part where I might offend people, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll let you decide. <laughs> where I go. There's lots of ways I could offend people. When it comes to people's personalities and what they're like and how they treat other people, um, I've said before, if government just fell into the ocean tomorrow, there are a whole lot of Christian statists that I would much rather be around than a whole bunch of the atheist anarchists I know. Because if the government wasn't there for them to beg to and vote for to, to rob me and control me, in their daily lives, they're perfectly nice and considerate and, and generous. Like when it comes to who they really are, absent the weird political monstrosity, they're really nice people. And there's some people who identify as anarchists who they don't advocate that government rob me and control me, but they're just kind of jerks. <laughs> <laughs> and so to me, what matters is, is the quality of the person underneath. And that's, that's an important thing, I think, to tune into because luckily it, it's sort of the good news and the bad news. The world is not suffering from billions and billions of genuinely malicious, psychopathic, evil people. It is suffering from a relatively small number of them and a huge number of people who have been taught to believe that when evil is committed by way of law and legislation and government and authority, then it's different. There's an exemption. It's okay. You can vote for it. You can proudly pay taxes that pay to, you know, bomb somebody on the other side of the world you don't know anything about. So it isn't that the individuals are like personally malicious and nasty and evil. It's that they're falling for a lie. And the thing is, that's very encouraging to me because it means that if those people can see through that lie, they change. Like if my, if I had to like go talk a world of evil people into being good, I give up. I'm running off in the woods somewhere because that's not happening. right. <laughs> but if you have a world of some evil people and then huge numbers of people who are basically good and trying to do the right thing, but can be tricked into accidentally cheering for evil, there is a way out, which is just to have them see through the lie and stop it. And if you look like this is this is one of the things that makes people very uncomfortable is to point out that when you look at those tyrannical regimes under Stalin and Hitler and Mao, and like there's been plenty of tyrannical regimes going back a really long time, they were cheered for by excited, well-intentioned, mostly good people who didn't understand what they were cheering for. They didn't know what was going on. Somebody came along and said, bad things are happening. If you give me power, I'll make the good guys win. And by the time they recognized, wait, when did the good guys winning turn into like mass murder and horrible, violent oppression? By the time they figure that out, it's kind of too late. You built the monster. So, and those images of all those, you know, in the streets, all the kids and the women cheering and smiling and waving their swastikas, like we need to be able to look at that and go, why did they think that? Does that look like a crowd of evil people? Do they look angry? No, they look happy and excited. Their savior is here to save them from like whatever real or imaginary injustices. And there were real injustices. That's most tyrants rise to power complaining about real injustices. You know, well, you have the Treaty of Versailles and that was really mean to Germany. So put this guy into power and they fall for the tricks and they fall for the basically false gods. They fall for somebody who comes along and says, I see the evil and I see how angry you are about it. Put me on the throne. I will save the day. And on the one hand, it's really depressing the amount of injustice and murder and oppression that has been cheered for and funded by well-intentioned people. And on the other hand, it makes me optimistic to know that The only thing that has to change is the understanding of those people. You don't have to make them good. Like they weren't evil people that you have to talk into being good. They were basically good people who were deceived by lies and manipulations and fear and all sorts of garbage. And if you can remove all those lies, 
you know, all the great deceiver garbage that's been tricking them into cheering for the wrong side, then it's not that hard to, to have peaceful coexistence and have people getting along and, and, and all that. Anyway, I've been ranting on and on. So maybe I should. No, I loved it. I loved it. But you know, let me, let me take a, a second here to offend some folks <laughs> and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offend some Christians here. And I, and I believe that, when, when a Christian goes and advocates for government, goes to a voting booth, they're in fact, because they know the corruption of the government. They know the corruption, the, the mass murder that happens behind government. They know the theft that goes on behind taxation. And in, when God said, thou shalt not kill, thou, thou shalt not steal. Okay. Christians, when they're going to vote, they're going to a voting booth. They're outsourcing their own sin to somebody else to, to commit in the name of freedom or whatever they want to call it. And this is where this is where I and I told you before we started recording the the Bad Roman project was born out of frustration on my end and some folks that helped me get it started and still participate along the way because what we saw happening you know as I was coming into anarchy and then the more I started studying and understanding what it meant it start, I, I could see how it would align with my faith, okay? And I thought I discovered something brand new. I was the first ever Christian anarchist and I had, I couldn't wait to tell everybody about it, you know, but turns out there's a bunch of us out there. You know, I got mixed up with some, with some, in some of these circles with other Christian anarchists. Now we don't all agree on certain aspects of the Bible, which <laughs> hell, if you can get two anarchists together and they agree on everything, I'll eat your hat. I just don't believe that's going to ever going to happen. But, but the, but when it comes, especially when it comes to Christianity, but I, mean, I got to tell you the story, your, your book, the most dangerous superstition Whenever somebody recommended that book to me, I had a friend, he he taught me a lot about liberty and, and freedom. I said, hey, do you know, any, know anything about this guy, Larkin Rose? He goes, oh, yeah. He goes, Larkin knows his stuff. He said, but I will tell you this, it's not, that book's not going to make you popular among your friends and family. <laughs> and I said, well, <laughs> I think we've, already, we're, we've gotten past that point because they all think I've gone crazy anyway because I've lost my mind. Because, I mean, I, the day after 9-11, and the folks that listen to the show know this, the day after 9-11, I turned into a neoconservative. With, I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know I was a neoconservative until I got mixed up with a bunch of libertarians. They started calling me a neocon. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Because yep. at the time, I was advocating for Ted Cruz, you know, against Donald Trump. And he would say things like, we're going to make the sand glow. I was like, yes. And that's just, that's just horrible. When I think back on the stuff that I used to believe, and then I started really when when I became an anarchist, it really opened my eyes to what I was reading in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Like I saw scripture different. I, I'm going to read a verse to you later. You know, something that Jesus himself said. And I've seen this scripture before, but it's a scripture. And I, and I commented on one of your posts on Facebook, but it's a scripture that Christians gloss over. And I glossed over. I glossed over it completely the whole time. But now as an anarchist, I can read it. Let me go ahead and read it to you. Because I think this might lead into some more conversation. It's uh, Matthew 20, 25 through 28. Anybody that's listening to it, I'm reading out of the David Bentley Hart New Testament translation, which, by the way, this book is interesting because there's the word hell is not mentioned one time in this, this translation. So he goes, he goes back to the original Greek and translates it from there. Anyway, let me read this. And you might get a kick out of this. He said, but Jesus calling them forward said to them, you know that the rulers of the Gentile peoples dominate them and that their great men will power over them. It is not so among you. Now, when I read that now, that's, that does not sound like a suggestion, folks, from Jesus. That sounds like a commandment straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself when he says it will not be so among you. And like I said, that was a scripture that I've read a hundred times. And I glossed over it like the vast majority of Christians do now. But now reading it as an anarchist, I'm like, oh, it will not be so among me. That means I don't go to the voting booth and lord over my neighbor or even my enemy. Because that's exactly what you're doing when you're going to put people in power over us, over somebody else. You're lording over them. You're telling them how you want them to live. That's not your job. And Jesus never instructed us to do that. Now, if, I'm, if I've not offended everybody so far yet... We still got some time to go. <laughs> so <laughs> here, here is a, an approach because you mentioned that the people know the corruption, they they know the the nastiness that goes on by way of government. There's a very weird phenomenon that that's sort of hard to describe, 
where people know things and don't know those things at the same time. And they're actually trying to not know them. And it's very bizarre. One of the, the main approaches I use when trying to bring out the, the inner voluntarist in somebody is basically to ask them to be personal, literal, and specific in answering questions just about what they can do, not to argue with them, but just, okay, let's be clear. And it's one thing for people to say, well, I believe in national defense and we have to defend ourselves from scary enemies. Okay. That sounds perfectly good. Or I believe in helping the poor. Okay. Me too. So far so good. But what are the specifics of what you're talking about? And so for example, if I, if I find something that they think taxes should be used to fund and I'll say, okay, if I, for whatever reason, let's say you want it to pay for the local police to protect the innocent. Okay, protect the innocent. I'm all in favor of that. What if I don't think they do a good job and I would rather pay these guys over here who I think they're more moral, they're more reliable, they do a better job, they're less expensive, and I refuse to pay the taxes that fund the government police you want? Now, I'm talking to you know hypothetical Christian or anything else and say, what is it that you want done to me specifically if I don't pay the taxes to fund the thing that you said you want government to do? And invariably you will see their brain starts to recognize that the honest answer, and then they backpedal. They start to do the, well, there are consequences to not paying. Yeah, I know there are consequences. In fact, I spent a year in a cage for not paying tribute to the IRS. I didn't ask what the consequences are. I asked, what do you personally advocate be done to me? Not as some vague terminology about public policy. And what do you want to have done to me if I don't hand over the money that funds the version of police that you want government to do? Well, you have to. You can very quickly see they're getting uncomfortable, which oddly enough is a good sign because the only reason they're uncomfortable is their moral code goes, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, like I don't want to come out and say, I want your door kicked down and I want you dragged away and put in a cage if you're not protecting. (laughs) In the name of protection, I want this guy dragged and locked up because he didn't want my version of protection. Going through that process of trying to get them to see past all of the dishonest rhetoric that every politician always uses. It's always general, nice sounding fluff. And like somebody on the left, they might say, well, I think we should care for the poor. It's like, okay, so do I. But in a political sense, what does that mean? Well, we need to give free something or other to people. Okay, free for who? Like who's paying for this? And eventually get them to see, okay, it's taxation. Well, If I want to like help people I know, like I think the government version of welfare is inefficient and corrupt and giving money to places that actually make things worse. But I actually know some people personally that that need help and I know they're decent people. They're down on their luck. What do you want to have done to me if I say I'm not paying the taxes for the government version? I'm going to do this on my own and help people I know are deserving, know are going to appreciate it, know it's going to actually help them. What do you want done to me? And the fact that there is always hesitation and backpedaling and floundering around is an indication of people's goodness because they don't want to blurt out the violence of government, even though everything government does is violence. So they do know that and they sort of don't know that. Like they're trying really hard to not see the reality of what it is that their political beliefs really mean when it comes right down to it. And you can do it with anything like gun control. It's like, okay, if I own that piece of metal that you want banned and for whatever reason, I don't turn it in. I haven't threatened anybody. I haven't harmed anything. What do you want done to me? Do you want men with guns to kick down my door and point a gun in my face and drag me off and put me in a cage for having a piece of metal? Is that what you want? And just not even arguing with them, just trying to get them to be specific and honest about what they condone makes almost everybody uncomfortable. Because when you make them have to admit what it is they're cheering for, almost everybody recognizes this is messed up. 
and I, I don't want to answer this directly and I don't know what to do because I don't, I mean, I do sort of believe in that stuff, but when I say it out loud, it sounds kind of bad. <laughs> sounds sort of horrible. It sounds like I'm advocating violence against a whole bunch of peaceful people because you are. If you vote for government, if you advocate government, you are advocating violence against a whole bunch of peaceful people, which I was too back when I was a statist. When I voted for Republican, I would have all these excuses for, well, I want less taxes and I want this and I just want government to do this and that and the other thing. Part of what made me accidentally fall off the political spectrum was just trying to get myself honest and consistent. And realizing, okay, I can't, I can't complain at the left that they're trying to force me to pay for a welfare state that I think is destructive and counterproductive and all that, and then turn around and say, by the way, it's okay if I force you to pay for the version of protection and police that I want. Like, wait a minute, then then I'm the thug. Like, this is this is for your own protection that I'm sending men with guns to your house to, to rob you. It's like, no, it isn't. That doesn't work. So I can't be doing that anymore. And just the process of recognizing what they're actually advocating in the real world is has been the most eye-opening process that I've seen people go through. And at this point, I've been a voluntarist for 27 years now, and I've gotten to watch hundreds and hundreds of people go through this process. It's almost never comfortable. It's almost always awkward and uncomfortable, and people are scared, and they don't know what to think. And they're like, yeah, but I can't let go of my my assumptions that I've had my whole life. And if I start to question it, all the people around me think I'm crazy and uh, I don't know what to do. So it's not a, it's not a pleasant escape from a lie, but it's just an escape from a lie. Like I don't have to tell them you're bad, please be good. Like, like that would ever work on anybody. I just have to ask them, well, what is it that you're actually advocating? And they notice that what they're advocating is bad, which is why they don't want to say it out loud. They don't want to say, (laughs) well, I want people to come to your house and drag you away and put you in a cage if you don't pay to help the poor. And if you defend yourself, I want them to kill you. Like that's the reality of it. But people don't want to say that and they don't even want to think that. And that is the problem is everybody who advocates a political solution, political authority, government at all. And this was true of me when I did that doesn't want to even see what it is that they're personally advocating because they want the feel good of, well, I am for protecting the innocent and helping the unfortunate and all the fluffy sounding goodness. But I don't want to admit out loud the violence that government's going to use to supposedly achieve all these noble ends because that sounds really bad. And it wasn't that I was evil when I was a statist. And it wasn't that I was trying to be dishonest, but I had this conflict inside my head that every believer in government has inside their head. And in in Christians, it's a very distinct conflict between what Jesus said and government saying, empower us and we'll use the violence of the state to achieve, you know, make the world what it should be. It's like, is that what Jesus taught? I don't remember that part. No, it's it's just so interesting to me too. And you mentioned you mentioned guns and, and this, this, you know taking people's guns. And listen, I, I own a pistol, and I talk about this on the show quite a bit. But I'm also a pacifist. Okay, now and I've learned to be a pacifist after reading early church writings. And I'm talking about pre Constantine writings, not past Constantine, but you know the early church stuff, because some of these folks were taught directly by the apostles themselves. And you know, and it's it really kind of really solidified my anarchy stance too with uh, reading how they viewed the Roman Empire. You know, uh, I'll, I'll get back to guns here in a second, but I want to mention his, his name's Tertullian. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's one of the early church fathers. And he's, he, would, he was very outspoken when it came to the Roman Empire. But he would say things like, we, I will not occupy a voter's booth. I have no interest in your public meetings. The affairs of state are completely foreign to us. Fast forward to 2023, the affairs of state are not completely foreign to your average Christian right now. The vast majority of Christians, the the vast majority of Christians are entangled with the state so much to the point that they can't see it. Now, getting back to guns, recently, I live in Tennessee, right outside of Memphis. We had that school shooting in in Nashville. And and almost immediately, you can see people come on on social media, start talking about demanding to take guns. And I'm talking about Christians. 
Christian pacifists I've seen talk about this on social media. And I'm like, okay, have you ever read a history book? What you're telling me is you want only the government to have all the guns. Have you ever read a history book, first of all? And who do you want to come take these guns from people? Do you want it done violently? Mm -hmm. Self-professing Christian pacifist. And I cannot get a straight answer from them. I cannot. And it turns into this mental gymnastic thing that they're trying to work around. I was like, no, get back to my original question. Who do you want to come take my pistol from me? Do you want to, do you want me to hand it over voluntarily? Or do you want some thug with a gun and a badge to come kick my door in and take my weapon from me? They won't answer it, Lark, and they will not answer it. And I cannot figure, I cannot get them to give me a straight answer on this. That's I, I want to give you a like a free subscription to Candles in the Dark <laughs> because we get into the psychology of why people go into these weird gymnastics and, and psychological dancing around when it's when it's something that clear cut. Like you either want them to come forcibly disarm me or, or you don't. Like that's you may bicker about the details of what you want, you know, taken by force, but it's an either or. Why don't you want to say which it is? And the thing is, the reason they do that tap dance around is because they don't want to admit the violence they condone, including to themselves. And that's why I do the approach of, of keep it personal, literal, and specific, but at which you, you're already doing a bunch of that when you say, if it's me and they outlaw this, and for whatever reason I say, I'm not handing it over, what do you want done to me? And if you make it as an open question, instead of um, like, you have every right to be accusatory because they are advocating gun violence against you while pretending to be pacifists, like gun control is gun violence. It's people with guns forcibly disarming other people, whether they threatened anybody or not. So it is gun violence. But the one of the things we teach in Candles in the Dark is that they so they have this obviously conflicting belief system that doesn't make any sense and that they don't even dare to look at. And if somebody is pointing out that's a contradiction and you're advocating evil, they double down on it, even when they can't even say what they think. They because it's so because of just the psychological way that the human mind works, which is not all that logical a lot of the time, <laughs> they'll double down if they feel attacked. But if you're all the way passive and not judgmental. And it's not that you don't have the right to be judgmental. They're cheering for you know, immoral violence against you. But if you train yourself to say, well, what do you want to have happen if I don't hand it in? Well, you have to. Ha and you can, they still will do the tap dance. And the whole goal is to lead them to the cognitive dissonance so that they see that inside their mind, there are two things that just don't match and cannot be reconciled. And they have to choose one and get rid of the other one. Either they should be all the way comfortable with saying, I want these outlawed. And if you don't hand yours over, I want men with guns to come kick down your door and drag you out. And if you resist, I want them to kill you. They should either be able to calmly say that because they really believe it, which is almost nobody. A few psychopaths might actually do that. <laughs> or they should recognize I'm not okay with this. Like as much as I wish there was some magic button to make guns disappear or something, I can't. I can't in good conscience do that. And you especially can't do that and pretend to be a pacifist. Like you're cheering for widespread violence and pretending to be a pacifist. That doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. You know, and, and this is not me advocating for a violent revolution. This is not at me advocating for people running around with guns. And that's not what I'm saying. If I had my brothers, I would want everybody, hand, everybody, including the government, to, to, to turn their guns into uh, plowshares, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's not happening. Yeah. I, I understand that, okay? So I want folks to, to take that seriously because, I, because when I talk about this, it seems like people will come at me like, they're, they're, like I'm advocating for some kind of revolution or I'm advocating for people just running around with bazookas and tanks and all that stuff. I do believe, however, this isn't one of the questions. Well, if, if the government has a bazooka, should I have a bazooka? Absolutely. I want you to have three bazookas. If you can afford them, buy them all. 
buy a tank. I don't care. If you're not harming anybody, not harming me with them, I don't care what you have. And that was actually the purpose of the Second Amendment was to have the, the people being better armed than the government. Yes. They said so. Both sides, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists said, uh, yeah, w w whatever we settle on here, we want the government to be able to outgun, I mean, the, the people to outgun their own government. Like that, that was the stated goal. It wasn't, they weren't talking about duck hunting. They were literally talking <laughs> about having the people able to win in a shootout with their own government, which, you know, is a horrible thought that it would ever come to that. But if it comes to that, and again, there, there's so many ways to, to bring it up to people that if you just try to get them to think about it, like, okay, you, ha you have two buttons to choose from. If you choose that one, then you'll know that from now on, the gun, the government can always win in a shootout with any number of the people. If you push the other one, the people will outgun the government and the people would win in a shootout between the, the people and the government. Which do you want? Because if you want the first one, you need to read a history book. <laughs> because we've had, exactly. we've had that a lot. It didn't go well in any <laughs> It's Asia. never gone well. It's never gone well. It's never gone well. I mean. <laughs> hey, folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors have no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page. And you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. I want to mention something too, and it, uh, one of your Facebook posts got a lot of traction when, you, when we were talking about we were talking about with Christianity and, and statism and stuff. And I was reading through the thread. I think I even commented a little bit on it too. And there was somebody asked you in the thread, and I thought this was so funny. They asked you said um, asked, asked you if you were an expert, or no, asked if you were a Christian, and you said no. And they said, "Oh, so you're an expert." And then you said, no, but I can read. <laughs> and I read that. I, I busted out laughing because it's right there in the red words of the Bible, the words <laughs> right. of Jesus Christ. Right. I have the ability to read this stuff. Even as, a you know, even if you're not a Christian, you can still read what Jesus was saying. And you see how these Christians are behaving. And I just, I had to tell you, I read that. And I, just, I, I laughed for probably five minutes straight about it. <laughs> it's the same conversation I had with a lot of Christian statists. Uh -huh. That, that you were having, and you're not even a Christian. That's why it was so amusing to me to read that. Yeah, and that one wasn't even about like some debatable doctrine. It was about the whole do unto others as you would have done unto you. It was like, if you're voting to have somebody violently rob your neighbor, I'm guessing you don't want that done to you. So, <laughs> And I'd love to hear what interpretation of do unto others as you would have done unto you somehow makes that okay. And that was that the actual phrase that he was like, well, are you an expert? Like, that that statement isn't really that hard to understand. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to be a great scholar to go, yeah. And a whole bunch of different cultures and religions have in one way or another their version of that. Um, I slightly prefer the reverse, which is don't do unto others what you don't want them to do unto you because it states it as the negative. In other words, leave people alone. <laughs> don't attack people. Don't don't be treating them the way you don't want them to treat you. Only literally every voter for every political candidate and party, every time they vote, is doing exactly what they don't want the other side doing to them. And they're doing it precisely because they don't want the other side doing it to them. They will vote and say, well, I'm trying to put this guy in power because I'm scared of that guy being in power. And unfortunately, that that's one of the most brilliant tricks here. I offend people in lots of ways. Democracy is the best trick tyrants ever came up with. Yeah. It's not better. It's literally not even better than a monarchy because if you can push democracy and pretend I'm representing the people and they consented to this, <laughs> now I'm going to give you two tyrants to choose from either way. You're doomed. You're going to be controlled and robbed and stomped on and kicked around. But first of all, that can make the people be mad at each other 
And then it can make it so we can say, well, whoever won, you consented to this. You agreed to it. And we got all of you to vote for evil. Yeah. Like this group was voting for this evil because I thought it was a lesser evil than that one. And this group was voting for this evil because they thought that was a lesser evil than that one. And the tyrants just got all of you to vote for evil against your own interests, against your own morality. And now you hate each other while the tyrants are just cleaning up and raking in the money and the power. And they're all having dinner together. They're all back yeah. behind the scenes having dinner together and drinks together and laughing at you. Yeah. This is absolutely. what's so strange to me too. And I've talked to I've talked to Christians on the left, I've talked to Christians on the right, I've talked to Christians in between. Okay. And to a to a man or woman, every one of them, I, I, like the left, they don't can't stand Joe Biden, but they were afraid of Donald Trump. Okay, and vice versa. So I'm, I'm, I, so, so what I'm saying is, so you're not voting on not and don't take this the wrong way. Because I don't I don't believe that um, there is I don't know if there's a, a vote that is principled. I don't know if that exists. But what these folks are doing, they're not voting on principle, per se. They're voting out of fear. And once you start voting out of fear, they've got you right where they want you because yeah. they can keep you afraid with each other. Just like you said, they can keep you fighting with one another all the while. They're only getting fat and rich. By stealing from you because y'all are afraid of each other. You should be afraid of them. Yeah. You should be afraid of the guys that you're putting in power. And it's another example of how it, it can help to break it down to just the, the specific reality of it. Because somebody will say, well, I voted Republican because Biden's really scary and horrible. And well, yeah, he's really scary and horrible. Did you just do something to put somebody in power who you knew was going to demand money from me for things I don't want and forcibly control me in ways that are unjust and immoral. Did you just help empower him? Well, yeah, but that other guy, I'm not asking about the other guy. I'm asking if you just enabled evil. And if your excuse is, well, other people want a worse evil, in what way does that protect me from the thuggery that you personally just empowered? Satan and Satan's twin just came up to you and said, choose one of us. And then you did. And you don't recognize that there's something horribly, horribly wrong with it. And you don't recognize that trick and how easy it was for them to get you to cheer for your own subjugation just by saying, well, we'll give you two to choose from. And just just breaking it down to, well, you tried to empower them, right? Well, like you voted for the guy hoping he was going to become president or whatever. Well, yeah. And you knew that if he did, he would oversee you know, the same tax system that's going to demand money of me to fund things I don't like. Well, yeah. And you knew what's going to happen to me if I don't pay up. Like you empowered that you voted for that. You helped make that happen, knowing what that would mean for me and several hundred million other people. And you, you did that. You helped to enable that. Now, if you want to say, yes, I helped to enable that, but it's because, okay, but the but it's because doesn't really hold any water. They, you just demonstrated that they tricked you into cheering for evil by just giving you another thing that you thought was even worse. And you, for some bizarre reason, took their word for it that the only two options in the world are let's empower this evil person to control us all or let's empower this evil person who happens to be his buddy and they're like having dinner every day to to control the world and you played the game and you empowered evil yeah and you victimized everybody you know like is that you know for christians i say is, does that really match your christianity and for everybody i'd say does that really match your morality that you will cheer for evil as long as somebody else is cheering for a worse evil is is that how we're playing this game? Like, is that going to go well? No, and it's 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 something too. Another source of frustration for me, and I, and I adore libertarians. I mean, I think they're they got they're kind of going in the right direction, but I think they're they're they can't get over the hump for some reason, and they have this idea that they can fix government. You know, you know everybody and everybody's like, well, Ron Paul, this wrong. I was like, Ron Paul proved once and for all that you cannot change the mafia from the inside out. Okay, so now we got to try. We need to figure out a different direction. OK, so and and, I, I, and a lot of I see Christian anarchists too getting back involved with um, the Libertarian Party and, and promoting like this Mises caucus stuff and stuff. And I listen, I've, they've got some good ideas, but it's still the state and you're still a Christian. Forget the anarchy side of it. 
Forget the anarchy side of it. You're a Christian. And people ask me, well, what's your, you know, what's your favorite scripture to go to or example in the Bible to go to when it comes to anarchism? I said, I go back to Jesus himself. When the, the, the temptation of Jesus Christ, when, they, when, when Satan offered him authority over the kingdoms of this world, and Jesus said, no, I'm good. I've already got my own kingdom. That's what, and if, Jesus, if we call ourselves Christians and that guy's our example, come on, and I'll start clicking with you at some point. Jesus said this. Jesus did this. Okay? He never advocated for you to go put somebody in power. In, in fact, he, he advocated for the opposite. He advocated for you to go serving people and helping people, not lording over them, you know. And I, that's just, it, it's, when I get into these conversations with Christians, it's, it, it becomes very frustrating because they're reading the same book I'm reading. But to be fair, and I, I have to be fair too, because I was not always like I am now. I mean, there was a time, like I said earlier, I was a neoconservative. I was doing all that thing because I was afraid of the Democrats. I was voting Republican, party line Republican. From since George W. Bush until 2016, I did not ever waver from that until Donald, you know, thank God for Donald Trump, because he, I started waking up. I was like, well, something's wrong here. I can't get on board with this. This idiot. This doesn't make any sense. You know, <laughs> that, and same thing was true of me like a long time ago. But I was, you know, desperately voting for this to stop that and not recognizing what it was. Another thing I thought of earlier is if. Like if somebody's like, well, I'm going to vote for this policy and because this is the system we have and it, it has to be done. Like one thing I try every once in a while is say, OK, will you just do me a favor? Like if it's somebody I know, if you're going to advocate that stuff, will you enforce it yourself? Like if you think I should be forced to hand over money to help the poor show up at my front door with a shotgun and just take it for me <laughs> yourself, like. Be honest, be open. I'd rather have it be you than a stranger because I'm pretty sure you'll probably hesitate to shoot me, I hope. Um, so just do it yourself because why would you be opposed to that? If you're asking somebody else to do it for you, then you must think it's good, right? So why don't you just do it yourself? And you might say, well, like you, <laughs> you think I might defend myself or something. But I'm hoping that before you say that, you realize, well, that would be bad if I did it. Yes, it would. <laughs> and it's bad if you ask somebody else to do it for you. And that that complete shirking of responsibility. There you go. Keep that wheel in your head turning. You're, you're getting, you'll <laughs> right. get there. Keep going. And that's there's so many ways, again, so many illustrations of how people do and don't know this. Like when you were neocon before even knowing what that was, you weren't trying to be evil. You weren't cheering for, yay, hooray, Satan <laughs> stuff. Given the template of, of what you understood and what you were surrounded by your whole life and all that, that seemed like, like the best choice at the time. And it's not until somebody backs up and is able to actually look at it objectively and go, why do we all do this? Like, I know we all do it. And we were all taught that this is the thing you do. And we have a constitutional republic and democratically, blah, 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 blah. And that's awesome and stuff because everybody says so. Oh, another way I offend people is if you think democratically elected constitutional republics make us awesome and special, you should go read the constitutions of the Soviet Union, Red China, and North Korea. Because guess what? All of them were democratically elected constitutional republics and they all have a Bill of Rights. Every single one. And you can go look them up and <laughs> read them if you don't believe me. But when we're taught, when we're surrounded by people, who accept this as just how things are, there's no incentive for people to actually look closer at it and go, what am I actually condoning? Like just the fact that I can ask almost anybody will say, if there's something that would be bad for you to do yourself, would it be okay for you to like pay someone else to do it for you? Would that make it like, if it's not okay for you to beat me up and steal my stuff, is it moral for you to hire somebody else to do it? Everybody, without exception, without hesitation, says no. And every single person who votes for government is being a total hypocrite, but they don't know it. They, they don't even notice. They don't connect two and two and go, wait a minute, when I'm voting, I'm doing exactly that. Everybody who votes, this was true of me back when I voted, is voting for the specific purpose of having government force used in a way that they know would be wrong if they did it themselves. 
like the people who want gun control, they know dang well that if they went out and said, I know there's no law about this, but I'm just going to disarm you for safety or something, or they would know that's wrong. If they went door to door to rob people to give to the poor, they would know that's wrong. And yet they've all been taught that if you do it by way of these weird rituals, which by the way, are very religious rituals, the elections, the ceremonies, the grandiose halls, the temples that these ministers of Satan inhabit, it's all about ritual and pomp and circumstance. It isn't just some guy saying, hey, give me permission to rob your neighbor. We have these glorious documents and we have the constitution. We have these, oh, so you know, respectable traditions of we vote this and we all go in on this day and at these big halls and then we do the count and we go through all these rituals and at the end of the day, we choose your new God. And the only difference is it is the worst God imaginable because it's the one that's easiest to prove doesn't exist because government isn't even pretending that like some deity said it was okay. They're just like, oh, we, we had documents and stuff. And now for some reason, we have superhuman rights. We're allowed to rob people. We're allowed to boss people around. We're allowed to violently control millions of people we don't know who haven't harmed or hurt anybody because law and representative government and constitutions and republics and stuff. It really is a religious belief. And it's the most heinous anti-human religious belief there could ever be. There's actually, a, somebody made a, my, fa my favorite video of mine is one I didn't make because it isn't my video. Somebody compiled a whole bunch of little things I did and made it into a video called Statism, the Most Dangerous Religion. And it's, I wish I had done that because <laughs> the way they edited it together, I love it. But it wasn't one speech of mine. It was like bits and pieces from all over the place. So I was like, whoa, that was awesome. I wish I thought to put it in that order. But it breaks down how this thing called government that most people think of as, oh, that's just sort of like how we practically organize to handle something or something or other. It's 100% a religious belief and insane and evil religion, but it's religious. It's not practical. It's not logical. Because if somebody came to you and said, hey, um, I'm going to forcibly rob all your neighbors so I can protect you from thieves, everybody would think that person was insane. But if they say, vote for me and I will use taxation to fund a proper blah, 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 and they say the same things using their weird dogma rhetoric, almost everybody goes, okay, you got my vote. It's like you literally just gave your money to somebody who said they would protect you by literally robbing everybody you know under threat of <laughs> violence. Did you not notice that? They don't notice it. I didn't notice it back when I was a statist, because I believed in the religion of government. I thought it was real. I thought it was legitimate. I thought government authority was a real thing. And now I recognize it's not. And now I actually have a hard time imagining having ever thought that, even though I did before. It's like, why did I ever think that made sense? Why did I ever think that was okay? And now I've gotten to watch lots and lots of people go through that process and go, wow, like, you don't realize how deceived you are until you stop being deceived and look back at it and go, how, how did they trick me into cheering for violence against everybody I know while thinking I'm being the good guy? But that's exactly what the belief in, in government and politics does. Yeah. And I, I, I yeah, it is bizarre. And I hundred percent agree with you that everybody has that inner voluntarist that's, you know, it's in there, you know, and I, I firmly believe that we're all born that way. But somewhere along the way, we get corrupted, whether it's in public schools or churches. I mean, you know, with the, with this podcast, I've had the opportunity to get to talk to people all across the world, which is fascinating to me. I still can't wrap my brain around that. But when I describe what I was seeing in church, and I'll tell you this, there was a time when I, I believed that, you know, we're a Christian nation, air quote, Christian nation. And I was sitting in church one day and they, it was one of the holidays for Memorial Day or Veterans Day or something. And they had the veterans stand up and everybody clapped for them and thanked them for their service. And then we all stood up and pledged allegiance to the flag right there in church. And at the time, it never dawned on me how how crazy, how, how wrong that is. Now, looking back, and when I mentioned this to people, when I talked to them across the world, my understanding of church is an American idea of church, okay? When I mentioned to this to somebody in Australia or Poland 
you know, or Russia or Canada or whatever, they kind of look at me out the side of their eye like, what are you even talking about? Because this Christian idea in America is so much different than it is across the world. It's strange. I don't, and I don't, and I've, I've often said too that the, the, the state has has gotten in bed with, or the, the, the church has gotten in bed with the state, but they've the, the state has co opted the church into believing this stuff in America. And it is a religion. You're absolutely right. It is a religion. And it's, <clears throat> I've had to repent of a lot of my past understandings of this stuff. And when you really, when I sit and think about how I used to think about things and how I view things now, I'm like, whoa. Man, where did you go, Craig? How did you get to that point? Because I've been a Christian my whole life. As far back as I can remember, my dad was a preacher. Okay, so as far as I can remember, I've been a Christian. How did I get to that point where I was celebrating the slaughter of babies in Yemen or Iraq or Afghanistan? You know, how, where did, what happened to me? And it was all, and then you learn this stuff in church, man, and people, and not, and, let me let me clarify this. Not all churches in America are like this. I know a lot of pastors who are not teaching this stuff. There are a lot of good ones out there that are trying to do the right thing. So don't I don't want to lump it all in together. But the vast majority of churches in this country do that. I've witnessed it. I've seen it. I haven't been to church in years. You know, the whole COVID thing really burned me on church when they started complying to these these lockdowns and stuff. And I just they were they were doing vaccines at the churches and stuff. So what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't been to church since, and I'm and I, I can't. And I, I spent a lot of time in Southern Baptist churches. You know, that's where one of those ones we stood up and the Pledge of Allegiance and stuff. And it just the, the flag on the stage never even dawned on me. This is horrible. That's another. I mentioned Tertullian a while ago. He said something too. He goes, "Shall we carry a flag? It's a rival to Christ." When I read the early church writings, it really screwed me up. But I think it screwed me up for the better. Yeah, because it really opened my eyes to. Oh, these folks prior to Constantine were not behaving the way we do today. Yeah. And we've messed this up somewhere along the way. We've got to get back to that that old time religion. You know, people like to talk about like not, not the 1950s. I'm talking about the first 400 years of the church. Let's get back to those guys and those gals who were teaching this stuff back then, the way they learned from Jesus and the apostles who followed Jesus around. You know, that's what I want to get back to. And that's what we try to do with this podcast. Yeah. And the reason it's so uncomfortable, uh, true of Christians or anybody else, that it sort of escapes the lie of statism. The reason it's so uncomfortable is because it is a very deep set faith in this thing called government, even though people don't recognize it that way. And that's also why it's so frustrating to try to talk people out of this, because it really is like for a while I said, you have to learn the methods that are used for occult deprogramming because this is occult deprogramming, the cult of government, because people believe it to the bottom of their soul to the degree that they don't even recognize what it is that they're cheering for. And they don't think it's a faith. They just think, well, that's reality. Those people, there were like rituals and documents and stuff. And yeah, that what they say is law. Why? Or like, did they float down from heaven or are they just people? <laughs> well, they're just people. But we did these weird rituals and now they're not just people. Wait a minute. That kind of sounds like a religion. <laughs> it really is getting people out of a faith-based thing because you can't reason anybody into the belief in government because it's not reasonable. Like if you weren't, if you and I weren't surrounded by it our lives, Think of how ridiculous it would sound. Imagine, you know, we're, we're living in a actually free society. There's no ruling class. There's still, you know, disagreements about stuff and people can have different religions and we get along and sometimes we don't get along and all that. And somebody comes along and says, give me the right to forcibly rob and dominate all of you and I'll improve your lives. Is there anybody in the world who would go, yeah, <laughs> no. Everybody would say, you're insane, and whatever we need, that isn't it. Please go away. And yet every campaign boils down to, give me power over you and everybody you know, and I will make the world a better place. And every voter is saying, I believe you, <laughs> Dink. But because it's all we've known, and like the Pledge of Allegiance is one of these, again, to demonstrate the, the, the religious aspect, to bash the the pledge of allegiance you know a lot of or the flag 
how dare if I see you trample on that flag, I'm going to beat the hell out of you and blah, blah, blah. Like, it's a, it's a collection of patterns of color. Like, if I come on your property, okay, you can get mad. If it's, if it's my own piece of cloth with a collection of colors and you would violently attack me for not treat, doesn't that kind of indicate to you that this is a deeply held religious faith that has nothing to do with practicality or logic? It has to do with an ingrained belief system that was pounded through your head since you were a little kid. So that now, and I remember, I remember feeling emotional about the Pledge of Allegiance. Me too, man. Because I was trained to. I was trained like a dog to feel loyalty to a collection of symbols. And it never occurred to me, wait, what am I even pledging? And to the Republic for which, that's a ruling class. (laughs) I am pledging loyalty to a parasitic, violent, authoritarian ruling class. And in any other context, Americans would go, wow, that's messed up. I pledge allegiance. It's just not, just as messed up when you do it too. But if that's what we, you were surrounded with your whole life, you don't, not only do you not notice it as messed up, but if you hear somebody like us talking about how weird that is, you probably get defensive and angry. Oh yeah. And you're trained in nationalism makes you want to decide that we're evil or you're, you're unpatriotic. I am unpatriotic. I feel no attachment whatsoever to a line drawn in dirt by a bunch of political parasites. Somebody on the other side of that line is just as much my neighbor and my fellow man as somebody on this side of that line. That line means nothing to me. So yes, I am not patriotic. And just to say that would offend and horrify so many people who don't even recognize that if you react that emotionally to somebody saying, I don't really think that about this. And and I've pointed this out too, that among self-described Christians, if you say, I don't believe in your God, a lot fewer of them get emotional and upset than if you say, I don't believe in government. Because government is the thing they actually believe in. And the other one is just the building they go to on Sunday. And it's it's sad, and I probably just offended some more people. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, man. Man, I'll tell you what, if I, if I haven't offended people along the way, we've been doing this since 2020. We actually started the project right around, right during the, the, the beginning of the COVID stuff, and which was an interesting time to start a podcast, you know. But if I haven't offended people over the past three years, then I probably ain't doing what I'm supposed to be doing anyway. <laughs> Because I needed to be offended at some point to get past what I was, what I believed in, you know, you know what I'm saying? But it, it really kind of took me to kind of just take a step back and look at it the way I see it now. Yeah, me too. And it, it, it's, it's just so strange to think about my old Facebook. Like I told you before, when we started recording, my old Facebook memories would pop up and I would like, I would see it not realizing it was a Facebook memory of mine. I was like, who is this idiot saying this garbage? <laughs> and it was me. <laughs> Did you type a nasty you comment? Know, so, You're such a moron. Oh, yeah, I'm fixing a reply to this idiot. Yeah, I'm fixing a reply to this idiot. I'm fixing to tell him how I feel about what he thinks. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's true of literally every voluntarist I know. They look back at, at, at what they used to think and go, how, why? Why would I have fallen for that? How could I not have seen through that? But you can't see the indoctrination until you're not inside it anymore. And then you look back and go, wow, that's so glaringly obvious. How could I possibly have missed that when I yeah. thought I was rational and I thought it was moral and I was cheering for that? Like, okay, well, I'm glad I escaped that. Yeah. Well, I want to touch on a couple of things before I let you go. You know, I don't want to keep you all night because I could talk to you. I love talking to you. This has been fascinating. But I had a question out of our discussion group, and she read your book, The Most Dangerous Superstition. I, and I like, like I said, I like to use the phrase fence setters, and I, I pick on her for being a fence setter because she's not quite where we are, she's, but she's a lot closer than she was when she first came across our podcast. And she had a question about, elaborate on what he said in his book about large weapons not being made without government. Why? And then she's like, why don't more anarchists talk about this? Because she she agrees with you. Like, if it wasn't for government, we wouldn't have these large weapons. And it reminds me of, of, of a roundtable we did very early on in the podcast. And her name's Jessica Green. She mentioned something. She goes, without, because we were trying to get, trying to explain what a, a, what we thought a voluntary society would look like. And this this kind of came up. And she said, if it, 
there would still be bad actors in the world, but they would not be able to marshal the same tools like a big government can with all the with the, the money they have to do this. And I, but I think that the question is valid is why do more anarchists not talk about this? In, in your opinion, what do you think that is? A, a lot of people got there from different directions. And I think a lot of people got there through like economic theory of like, it actually works better if you don't have a ruling class, which is also true. Um, but there's sort of a limit to how much a lot of people seem to sort of think through the the concerns and what ifs, like a, a, a common thing I hear among people is, well, if there isn't a ruling class, what's to stop some big gang from, from taking over? And first of all, if you have a government that already happened, it's called government. Yeah. <laughs> but they miss a huge part of the equation, which is, okay, if you have this gang of nasty people, because there are some nasty people in the world, if you have a gang of nasty people and they're like, ah, oh, we're going to enslave these 300 million people over here, hand over, you know, a trillion dollars a year to us. It's like, okay, well, you just said that to 300 million people and zero of them feel morally obligated to obey you. And a hundred million of them are heavily armed. <laughs> so do you think this is going to go well, Mr. Gang of Thugs? Like, unless you have like a million of you, which you don't, but people miss how much the power of government doesn't come from their evil. And again, this is, this is sort of good news. Like when this, when this finally struck me, you know, it was like 27 years ago, but it finally struck me. It, it's so easy to look at, oh, the big powerful government and these powerful people, all of their, of their power, every last speck of their power comes from the people they duped giving it to them. The people who obey them, the people who pay taxes, the people who act as enforcers, soldiers and cops, the people who do their bidding. Like imagine Congress, all those scary people, and nobody felt obligated to obey them. You literally wouldn't even hear about what they were doing because nobody would care. Like you think congressman is going to come to your house and try to rob you? Like that's not going to go well. And they know it. No, they're cowards. They're cowards. Yeah, they're cowards and they're accomplished liars and nothing else. And if people aren't falling for that lie, the ability of some gang to by brute force do anywhere near the damage of government is just ridiculous. Like you look at all those giant authoritarian empires, they weren't the result of somebody saying, I get to rule you because I'm big and bad. They were the result of somebody saying, I want all you people to give me power so I can protect you. And all the duped people gave them trillions of dollars and permission to have, you know, nuclear warheads and bombers and tanks. And like, where do you think the gang is going to get that if they don't have people who feel obligated to pay for it? Like, how do you think you build? And people are like, well, the evil corporations would attack. Okay, let me know if there's no ruling class. What do you think Pepsi is going to do to me if I don't buy some Pepsi? <laughs> like, they don't have government to use anymore. Do you think they're going to spend a billion dollars to create an army which would be wiped out overnight by the people going, wait, you don't get to make us buy your soda? No, it just falls apart just economically. And just if you just understand cause and effect, you can't make a gang that big able to forcibly dominate that many people, especially that many people who are armed. But people have these, but what about this and what about that? And they're trained to have those fears by the ruling class. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with V for Vendetta, but that line is, we can never have them forget why they need us. <laughs> In other words, keep everybody scared to death of each other. It's like, yeah, there are some nasty people in the world and they don't scare me in the slightest compared to that one psychopath who just convinced the vast majority of my neighbors to give him permission to rob and dominate me and all of them and everybody else. Like if they don't have the loyalty of their victims, if their victims don't believe in their authority and their right to rule, because that's what authority is, they have no power. They aren't anything. And so the, the point at which I got, because I was like politically involved when I was like still had last vestiges of statism, 
But part of me knew this is never going to work. We're not going to get to freedom by way of the political process. It's totally a rigged game and the people don't even want freedom. And so I was, you know, depressed and frustrated and angry and stuff. And the thing that actually gave me optimism, and I actually am very optimistic despite all the insanity going on in the world. The thing that gave me optimism was to realize the decent people outnumber the psychos by a huge margin. Absolutely. We don't have to like go overthrow some giant evil monster. We just have to stop supporting it. Yeah. We have to stop paying it and being its enforcers and paying tribute to it and obeying it. And then it literally isn't anything. There's nothing to fight. There's nothing to overthrow. We don't need a revolution. The thing that matters is the belief system between the ears of 300 million people or 7 billion, if you're including the whole planet. When that battle is won and people stop recognizing human rulers, it's over. We win. Because if somebody says, I'm your king, and everybody says, no, you're not. Yeah. Well, that's that. <laughs> like they don't have any enforcers and nobody's giving them anything. So they're not. It's literally a matter of if everybody thinks that that guy is their king, then he is. And if they don't, then he's not. And that is the only difference is the belief in the minds of the subjects. Is this government, does it have the right to rule me? Does it have authority? And the day everybody goes, you're just a bunch of conniving crooks. We don't have any obligation to listen to you at all. That's the end. That's the end. Because it's just the lie that gives them all their power. It's just the lie, which is why my focus is not, let's go do something to the people in DC. They don't matter. We need the rest of the world, Christian and otherwise, to stop being tricked into cheering for things that if they look closely, they recognize as absolutely evil. When the good people stop enabling evil, we're done. Like the evil people are way outnumbered and way outgunned. They're a trivial threat compared to the people empowered by good, duped people, which is everyone who believes in government. Well, you were, I think you were the first person that I heard say this, that the belief in authority, it's an illusion. It doesn't exist. And I never really, and I'm paraphrasing what you said, obviously, but I, I've never really thought about it that way. When you thought, when I thought about it, you know, that makes sense. And you just laid it out right there too. And it reminds me of, a, and I, I don't know, I can't, even if I can remember the guy's name, I'm not going to be able to pronounce it. It was a French philosopher. You may know who I'm talking about. And I'm going to paraphrase what he said. He said, I'm not asking you to take up arms against the, the government. I'm asking you to support them no longer. And you can watch them fall under their own weight. Yep. Etienne de la Boite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. See, I can't. I've, <laughs> I could not do that. I've tried to pronounce his name. I'm, I'm from West Texas, man. I have a hard time pronouncing anything anyway. So, um, <laughs> took me 30 <laughs> tries to actually get it right. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but when I, I read that quote, I was like, that's it. That's it. Stop supporting them and let's just watch them fall. Yeah. Under their own weight. Because if we stop supporting them, we, they don't exist. Yeah. They're just people, just like you've been saying this whole show. They're just other people. Yeah. That's it. And all, literally all we have to do is recognize them as you're just people. You don't have special rights. You don't have special powers. You're psychos. Most of you are kind of evil. Yeah. But if we stop imagining you to have the right to rule and we stop imagining that we have an obligation to obey the garbage you call law and taxes, who cares? Like, you know, some old grouchy crook is not really a threat to anybody if nobody's putting him on a freaking throne and bowing to him. All right. One more thing I want to, I want to run by you before I let you go. And something that I ran into, and I think a lot of people that are coming into this are going to run into as well, especially as a Christian anarchist. When I started explaining my, my faith and Jesus is my King, we use the phrase, no King, but Christ. Okay. And when I would say something like that, I would run into secular anarchists who would, would come back at me with, uh, and I'm sure you've heard this. You may have even said it yourself sometimes. No masters, no rulers, no gods. And I would just dismiss it at first because I was still trying to understand the philosophy. Okay. But the longer I, the more I started understanding it. And I'm pretty sure every other Christian anarchist on this earth right now would say the exact same thing that I'm fixing to say. If I can't keep my Jesus, then you can keep your anarchy. Okay. The reason I believe anarchy is a thing and the reason I'm an anarchist is because I'm a Christian first. OK, and so I would I would come at him with that. And then I got I talked to Alan Mosley on the show and he's a he's an atheist, anarchist. 
And I talked to him a little bit about it. And he said something. And th- he said this. He goes, no, it's no ma- no forced masters, no forced rulers, no forced gods. And if I would, and I can get down with that. And I, if you want to say, if you want to say that to me, I was like, all right, I can get, because I'm not going to force my Jesus on you. I'm not going to force anybody on you. I'm an anarchist. Okay. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious. I, I kind of want you to kind of explain that a little bit, maybe where you come at that with, uh, with, with that no masters, no rulers, no gods mentality, which I understand. But at the, at the end of the day, I'm still a Christian and I still have my King Jesus and I'm not going to leave my King Jesus. Yeah. I don't ever put the no gods on the end of it. And there's a reason the and it, it ties in with so many things. I'll try, I'll try to keep this sort of succinct. When I talk to people who are, identify as Christian or as, as some other religious faith, I say, okay, my first question is, are you going to try to violently impose your preferences and your beliefs on me? And if they say no, okay, okay, cool. So far, so good. But m- more importantly and more interesting to me, I've one of the things I often ask people is, which of the following more closely describes your God? He commands you what to do and then kicks you if you don't. Or he is a loving guide who says, this is how you must behave in order to be a happy, fulfilled person. Like, I'm not here to like hurt you because you disobeyed some arbitrary whim. I'm here to instruct you on how to be what people are supposed to be. And I've noticed in the past 10, 20 years a big drift away from the authoritarian version of you do what I say or I kick you, says the God, to he actually is instructing and wanting us to do the right thing for our sake and for the sake of the other people that we're not, you know, harming and stuff. But it's a guy. And the fact that the the 10 commandments, they're not, they're actually not in the imperative tense. It's no, this, no, no killing. It's actually no murdering. No murder, no stealing, no this. It, it's it even though in English it comes out as imperative, it's a description. It's basically saying, if you want to be a decent human being, here's what you do, and here's what you don't do. And so to me, there is there can absolutely be beliefs in gods that people use to justify violent aggression against their neighbors, but there can absolutely be gods that people don't use for that. They use it as, this is my measure of how I'm supposed to be as a human being. This is this is what was intended for humanity that I'm trying to do. So while government can never be legitimate, the belief in God can either be an excuse for authoritarian domination or a source of one's own belief that for them trying to be the best person they can be. And so... To me, a god isn't automatically bad. It isn't automatically authoritarian and evil and, and oppressive. So I don't ever say no gods. And I know, uh, and I've gotten into more debates than I can count, because there are some atheist anarchists who go, well, you can't have religion either. It's like, yes, you can. <laughs> if the religion doesn't include and kill anybody who doesn't believe what you believe, yes, you can. And... And I like I know a whole bunch of Christian anarchists, and it's like, oddly, none of them have threatened to kill me if I don't believe what they believe. So far, we made it through this whole show, and you haven't threatened to murder me for not sharing all of your <laughs> beliefs. So we're doing pretty good. So the idea that you can't have religion or a belief in gods and have peaceful coexistence is just ridiculous to me. Now, I have a little bit of sympathy because in the past of human history, there were a lot of cases where the violent dominating rulers were acting in the name of the church instead of calling themselves government in a bunch of different religions where we have the right to rule because, you know, the lady of the lake lobbed a scimitar at me or whatever. And now God said, I get to be your ruler. And now I'm going to slash and burn and do whatever I want, rob everybody. So the fact that that has been used as an excuse in the past is I'm sure why a lot of people go, well, I'm scared of religion too. Yeah, but it doesn't have to be well, used for that. Yeah, but there are plenty of people who are religious and believe in God who are the exact opposite of that. I said, no, I actually believe in peaceful coexistence. Like Jesus wasn't, hey, go slaughter everybody who doesn't believe in me. There's nothing like that. 
And so I don't add no gods and I don't, I don't bash religion. Very often I'll have to get into, all right, do you think your religion justifies violent aggression against me? Because then we kind of have a problem. But if not, then we don't. So religion in and of itself or believing in a God in and of itself is not automatically mutually exclusive to, to anarchism. In fact, it is the thing, anarchism, a lack of a political belief in political authority is the thing that allows a whole bunch of different religious beliefs and atheists and agnostics to peacefully coexist. Because the only thing we have to have in common is that we all say, all right, we're not going to initiate violence against each other. You can believe what you want. You can even have habits and a lifestyle that I think are stupid and, and destructive and a bad idea, as long as you're not forcing it on somebody else. And I can try to talk you out of it and I can try to save your soul and encourage you not to do dumb, short-sighted stuff, but I'm not showing up at your gun with a SWAT team with machine guns pointed at you. And if that's the entire standard, that is actual tolerance of I'm going to let you make choices that I think may be dumb. I may like try to talk you out of it and religious people can try to talk me into believing this and, you know, but if we start with the premise of, but we're not attacking each other, which is about as basic as you could get. If you were describing the teachings of Jesus, don't attack other people. Like you can't really get the more basic foundation than that. Like if you're going to love other people, that kind of implies don't violently attack them. And if we have that in common, the rest of it just becomes interesting discussions about religion and spirituality and the nature of the universe and physics and science and everything under the sun. But until we get to that point, everybody's at war with everybody. And that's, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not scared of, you know, people being religious or believing in God and, and, like I'm scared of them believing that somebody has the right to to commit violence against me, and a whole lot of of religious people in different religions and atheists and agnostics have now realized that's not okay. Like I don't particularly care what somebody's reason for their moral code is. Like somebody may say, "Well, I I believe in live and let live and get along and being peaceful because of the Bible." And somebody else may say, "Well, I just think I don't believe in God, but I think this is just how people should be." And to me, whatever the foundation of it might be, as long as we can agree on don't attack each other, then we can talk about the rest instead of having shootouts about the rest of it. And so I I it does frustrate me when I see religious anarchists and atheist anarchists sort of at each other's throats. So you can't have religion and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, people can have discussions and disagreements about theology and the nature of reality and whatever else. But if somebody decides you can't be an anarchist, if you believe in God, that's totally not true. Or you can't be an anarchist. If you're religious, that's totally not true. In fact, if anybody has a specific reason to be an anarchist, it would be Christians because Jesus Christ, Right. Absolutely taught tolerance and, and nonviolence. So yeah, anyway, that's my <laughs> that's my rant on that. Well, you know, and it's if if anybody and I say this I say this <laughs> why not I love that. And it's something I say quite a bit now too is yeah, if anybody should be suspicious of the state, it should be a Christian. I mean the state, the Roman Empire murdered Jesus Christ, the one, our King, the one that that we follow, you know, and you know, of course, there was religion involved with that too. So the religion and the and the empire were connected together, and they murdered Jesus Christ. So if anybody should be suspicious, it should be Christians. If you're if you're a Christian, and you're listening to this, and you have not reached the anarchist side of this yet. You need to keep going because the two words when I when I say I'm a Christian, you should automatically think he's an anarchist, or at least understand that he has nothing to do with the empire. Yeah, but Sadly, these days, it's just not true. And that's what we're trying to do with the project is get people back to that that situation where we believe that there's no king but Christ. And we want to do unto others as the golden rule. You know, we want we want what's best for each other. You know, we're talking about the, the, the loving God. I'm that person. I believe in that side of God, because when Jesus came on the scene and he said, when you see me, you've seen the father, which there's a lot of things going on in the Old Testament that 
Jesus would not advocate for. So you got to wonder if these folks got some things wrong along the way. And Jesus came, Jesus had to come down Mm -hmm. and be like, all right, no, this is what I meant, you know? And so we, you've got to take the words of Jesus seriously. And that means not advocating for government and not advocating for a politician or a ruler. And I think I did notice um, when, he, when you when you say no masters, no rulers, I did notice that you did add no gods on the, on the end of that. So yeah. I do appreciate that. And, and I told you before we started recording that as long as I've been following your, you know, your videos and just you, you on social media and stuff, you seem to have a, a certain amount of respect for Christian anarchists because you you get along with this and you kind of appreciate what we're doing and you don't, you're, you're, you're a different type of anarchist where you don't come at us and yeah. like, you can't have no Jesus, you know? And, and I appreciate that about you, Larkin. And I, and I hope that I have not uh, kept you too long. I'm, I'm maybe down the road, we could do this again sometime. I really enjoyed uh, talking with you today. Yeah. Yeah. It's been fun. And just in case I haven't guilt tripped anybody <laughs> enough. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that as somebody who doesn't even identify as Christian, I would ask all the people out there, Christians, what do you think it means when it says, thou shalt have no other gods before my face? Who do you pay tribute to? Who do you obey? Who do you ask to fix the world? If it's a bunch of people in Washington, you really need to reread that particular commandment a few times. Right. When even Jesus, even Jesus said you can't you can't serve two masters because you'll love one and yeah. hate the other. And if, if people aren't objective enough to go to back up and go, well, the fact that we've just assumed this and always done it, maybe that doesn't really make it okay. Yeah, it doesn't make it okay. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> does it does not make it okay. <laughs> Take a step back and just look at the whole thing. Well, before I let you go, do you have anything you want to plug where people who aren't familiar with you can be directed to your stuff on YouTube? And- uh, well, yeah, if you go on YouTube and search for my name, you'll find eight gazillion um, videos about all sorts of things, in- including um, one about anarchism and-, and Christianity. I think there's there's two very different categories of people t- to me. There's the people who aren't yet ready to have a calm discussion about it. And they're still like triggered and emotional and feel defensive because they feel threatened because it, if, if what you've always believed doesn't match what somebody talking to you sounds like, it's easy to think, well, I'm the good guy. So whatever they're preaching must be like evil and, and insane and stuff. And to them, I would ask them instead of like, believe me, I'm your new authority. See how closely you can examine your own political beliefs and what it is exactly and specifically that you want inflicted on the rest of mankind. And then to those who are ready to to sort of have the discussion and think about it, then there's like my book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, and there's you know a million other videos and, and discussions everywhere. But I know that first step is really uncomfortable and difficult and awkward, and it feels weird because if you imagine yourself to be one of the good guys, because you're, I assume everyone in your audience is trying to be one of the good guys, and you've always believed something, it can feel really uncomfortable and awkward to go, was I like accidentally cheering for evil that whole time? <laughs> and one of the hardest things in the world is to dare to back up and judge yourself objectively and go, was I really true to what I said I believed in? And who I said I was, because if you're still playing politics, you're not being true to your moral code, whether you're a Christian or anything else. I guarantee you are betraying yourself and your own understanding of right and wrong, whether it's from the Bible or anywhere else. And I, I totally sympathize with how uncomfortable it can be to question. Like if you always, well, I'm the righteous one and I believe the good stuff and I know what's good for the world. The scariest but most important thing is take a break from telling everybody else how wrong they are and back up and make sure you're actually in line with what you say you believe. 100 percent. 100 percent. I agree with that so much because before I can start telling somebody how they need to live their life, I need to make sure I've got my stuff in order, that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And if because if I don't, then I'm just being a huge hypocrite. Yep. The whole beam in the eye and moat in the eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure. All right, man. I appreciate this. This is this has been a lot of fun. I've been pretty excited about this. And you know, I mean we have the the Facebook private discussion group 
for folks who follow the podcast and follow um, the project in general. And I mentioned that you were coming on and people are super excited to get to hear this. And I'm, I can't wait till we publish it. So everybody can hear an hour and a half of me and Lark and Rose going back and forth together. This is fun. It's been fun. We'll have to do it again sometime. I look forward to it, man. I will talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcasts to never miss an episode. And while you're at it, if you like what you heard, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, it really helps people find us. 100% of donations are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about The Bad Roman Project and to find show notes, please visit thebadroman.com. Bad Roman.